Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our quarter two webinar for 2019. And today we are exploring some of the themes around value and, and growth in, in the market and um, what, what these metrics can mean for, for different uh, investors. So we'll be looking at, at a number of, of different themes. My name is Claire Renska. I'm the Chief Investment Officer at 27.4 Investment Management. And I'm joined this morning by Nadia Token. If you have questions, please feel free to uh, to enter them as as we we go along. We will try to save some time at at the end to to get to to all of your your questions and to to answer them. So so far here to date, uh, we have seen that the market has has really had its it's ups and, and it's downs. And the the year has started with equity markets performing very, very strongly. And we've seen um, a rally throughout the, the first quarter of, of the year and and through through the month of, of April as as well. But May has has proved to, to be a bit more challenging and we've seen that the, the market has started to, to pull back and, and show signs of uh, more weakness in, into to the month of May. And one of the themes we'd like to, to investigate this morning is, is whether the low growth environment has been entrenched within South Africa. Uh, we've seen that over the past 10 years almost that business confidence has has been low uh, fixed asset investment has has been has been weak with companies uh, declining to to invest into their infrastructure and and expansion within the the local South African market we've also seen that the the consumer has has come under considerable pressure and to a large extent we we haven't really seen those those pressures on on the consumer play out uh, as as much as one would have expected so you know has has this low growth in environment become endemic is it something that that's difficult to to unlock and is it going to impact the returns that south african specifically domestically faced businesses are, are going to to face and and have in uh, as a, a noose around their necks in terms of being able to to grow their their earnings and and prosper within the the local market and we've seen a mixed bag of of results um that there have been many companies that that have had had pressure and and have come under considerable, especially the, the consumer facing businesses have come under considerable pressure with regards to what they're able to, to deliver in terms of, of top line earnings and, and specifically earnings growth. But one does risk run the risk of being too pessimistic because on the other hand, there have been a handful of uh, businesses who have been able to, to deliver positive earnings growth. We can look at the, the likes of Eclix and Italtal, uh, Pick and Pay and, and Pepcor have all been able to, to, to deliver very respectable results and, and to, to continue to, to grow their, their earnings well ahead of what what economic growth is and and in a very different uh, in a very difficult and and constrained environment um so you know there there are there are definitely risks to to south african facing you know domestic businesses um and and to to the south african consumer and and the our macroeconomic performance and and the the state of of the fiscus means that although they they are companies that that are doing well there, there are also heightened risks that that uh remain and and really the 
the asset classes that that will be negatively impacted by the inability of the the South African economy to to grow are going to be the the domestically facing South African equity as well as um, South African nominal bonds. Um, none of the the issues and and the risks that the the country faced in terms of of the the uh, positioning and, and in terms of the inability to to grow have have been removed. Eskom and and the state owned enterprises are still a huge overhang on on the fiscus and and our inability to to grow and and to to create jobs will weigh very very heavily on on those asset classes. On the other hand, the the South African rand hedged equities are able to continue to to grow in markets that that aren't subject to to the same economic malaise that the south african market has has faced so rand hedged equities might may continue to do very well in an environment where where sa growth is is constrained but global growth continues to to be strong and the same goes for for global market equities and 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 global bonds if global growth can continue to to deliver, but but SA continues to to remain constrained, then we could still see that um, that global equities continue to to run, and and that the rand hedge, the big rand hedge stocks continue to to do well. And if we if we look at a, a snapshot of of business confidence, we can see that you know business confidence has has yet to to pick up. Uh, there have been many risks that that the economy faces, that that business faces, and even though we've we've seen um, a, a change in in the guard in in terms of the um, the president, we have the the same ruling party that that continues to to run the the country following the the elections earlier in in the month, but. None of this has has had a big impact on on business confidence yet, and business confidence continues to to wane, and and earnings growth has has definitely deteriorated. So there there can continue to be considerable headwinds that that face uh, South African businesses, and the the ability to generate earnings is is going to be key for for a lot of these these companies hi everybody it's uh, nadir here I'll, I'll pick up on the next theme um so claire's already touched on the fact that equity markets have re-rated very strongly uh, into the start of 2019 uh, we've given some of that back in may but by the end of april we were up well into the double digits in fact around 13 percent for the all share index year to date by the end of april um, and there's a lot of questioning around the market whether uh, you know the kind of re-rating we've seen has been too strong given the very uncertain environment Environment within which we're operating. Uh, Claire's already mentioned the low growth environments in SA becoming entrenched and the impact that that has had on companies' ability to grow earnings. And we saw further manifestation of that yesterday with the release of Pioneer Foods results, where uh, they actually had fairly credible top line growth in terms of growing volumes, but an inability to pass on significantly increased costs meant that uh, margins contracted quite a bit, earnings went backwards, and the share was absolutely obliterated down around 12% in trade yesterday. So there is a lot of concern that this very uncertain market environment is not conducive to the kind of equity market re-rating that we've seen uh, so far this year and whether um, in fact it's time to take some profits from the strong equity performance we've seen this year um, and in fact we, if we could be in for some sharp de-rating and uh, giving up of some of the strong returns we've seen, um, especially given the low return environment we've been going through over the last three to four years. Um, so what we've charted over here is that we've basically charted um, where the forward multiple of the JSC was at the start of the year, where we are currently, and then where the five and 10 year average is histo uh, historically uh, going back. What you'll notice from this chart is that, yes, there has definitely been a re-rating in equities thus far um, in 2019, but that re-rating in equities has not even gotten us to the long-term average forward multiple for equity market for the JSE. So 
if you think about it from the perspective of at the start of 2019 after a brutal 2018 uh, sorry after a brutal 2018 that's correct uh, you know we saw equity markets trading at quite a big discount relative to their long-term average and the re-rating we've seen thus far um, there hasn't been much earnings led growth given the kind of earnings update we've seen yes there's been pockets of very good earnings updates but in composite earnings have been fairly sanguine thus far in 2019 but the re-rating we've seen has ultimately just taken multiples to in line with their long their 10 year long term average in fact slightly below and quite considerably below their five year average although those five year average numbers are quite distorted by a uh, rand hedge industrial shares trading at quite a big premium given how much the rand has weakened and also um prior to the start of 27 uh, prior to the start of 2017 uh, commodity prices being so quite depressed which means that so which meant that spot multiples for uh, the resource businesses were quite high so the five year average might be uh, distorted a little bit higher by artificial factors uh, but in fact the current multiple after the big re-rating we've seen so far this year is pretty much not even in line uh, with the long-term 10-year average so we'd argue that yes we've seen strong equity markets so far this year uh, but we certainly haven't seen excessive multiple expansion to the extent where we are quite concerned that valuations are quite stretched and on the back of purely valuations, we could see quite poor returns from equity markets going forward. That's definitely not our base case scenario. And we certainly believe that there remains uh, some opportunity entrenched within equity markets. Um, if we move the discussion onto what has been the source of this re-rating of the domestic equity markets, uh, typically one of the factors we look out for is how have foreigners been participating in our markets and how have we performed uh, relative to other emerging markets uh, ar around the world. Um, and if you look at this chart, we the, South Africa is the dark brown line. What you'll notice is that we have not re-rated considerably more than other emerging markets around the world. And in fact, we remain quite a distance behind um, how well uh, 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 China, as, uh, China as well as uh, Russia has done year to date. Um, and in fact, we've seen substantial outflows from our equity market, the foreign outflows from our equity market this year, We're in the tune of 30 billion rand. And what this chart ultimately tells us is that the re-rating and the multiple that we've seen so far this year has not necessarily been driven by foreign investors being big buyers of South African equities. And we know that that would concern us if the re-rating was driven by foreign investors. We know that foreign capital remains exceptionally fickle. Um, it comes in when sentiment is good and it flocks out when sentiment turns bad, irrespective of underlying company fundamentals. Uh, so it hasn't been that kind of very hot capital which has re-rated our market. So um, you know what we take away from this is that we're not necessarily susceptible to significant derating on the back of a on the back of hot foreign capital which came into our market exiting quite rapidly and we think that uh, that's a far more sustainable gain for the JC and in fact it's been predominantly low local institutions uh, which have been closing their underweight position within South African equities, which have uh, driven uh, driven those multiples more in line with averages from a big discount at the start of the year. If we move on to the discussion to, uh, you know, are there, are, are there actually any opportunities which exist within the equity markets? Uh, you know, we've spoken about the very tough operating environment. We've spoken about the fact that domestic businesses are find it very, finding it very difficult to, to grow their earnings and maintain their margins. Um, you know, we argue that there still is a fair amount of opportunity available in the domestic equity market. Um, and one of those opportunities, we'd argue, continue to remain in the resource sector, although it's fairly late cycle. The bottom line is that these guys have cut a lot of supply out of the market, shutting down a lot of unprofitable operations, as this graph would indicate, with CapEx be remaining well below historical CapEx over the last couple of years and for forecast to remain well below historic capex for a, for a very long period of time and what this has meant is that spot commodity prices have remained very very buoyant uh, you know with iron ore now well in excess of 140 dollars a ton um you know copper prices remain very buoyant oil prices in fact is remaining were entrenched above the 70 dollars a barrel mark which is quite good for for, for Sassel as an example uh, and good for bhp billiton which has some oil operations so the bottom line is that with uh, a lot of supply not coming back into the market spot commodity prices can remain at these levels miners are very cash generative at these levels and ultimately remain very profitable and quite a good opportunity so although the easy money has been made out of the sector and a big re-rating has happened 
we'd argue that supply is the key thing to watch in the commodity space. Um, and as long as supply remains quite depressed, uh, we could see these uh, buoyant prices and perhaps a further extension happen for some time, although it is quite late cycle. Um, if we look at uh, 10 cent, um, which obviously South African investors access through NASPERS, that remains an unparalleled growth opportunity on the JSC. Now, we all know about uh, how successful they've been at gaming and capturing the gaming market within China and reporting, you know, circa 50% earnings growth quarter in and quarter out for, for a couple of years. But, you know, the next avenue of growth for this company undoubtedly remains the industrial internet. And uh, we've seen how successful Microsoft has been in terms of penetration penetrating this market within the US and the rest of the world. Uh, Tencent is exactly trying to capture that exact market within China with cloud compute spending definitely on the rise. Uh, to market share is quite low in terms of uh, cloud computing uh, in, in, in China relative to the rest of the world. So it's a strong avenue for growth, which uh, you know Tencent can continue to capture and ultimately NASPA shareholders uh, can continue to benefit from even after the unbundling of all offshore businesses into the Euronext listing because NASPA is still ultimately uh, retaining a 75% shareholding uh, within that business. And it's still, and it's very much the same story to play out in the enterprise software space as well with penetration rates quite low in China and, NASP and, and, and Tencent investing quite substantially into gaining uh, increasing market share from this. So undoubtedly Alibaba is still remains the leader in the industrial internet space in China, uh, although there's enough to go around for um, you know, Tencent to continue to grow aggressively in the space. And we're seeing you know, circa 40% uh, revenue growth from their cloud computing business. And uh, you know, on those numbers continuing into the future, uh, this could undoubtedly con uh, continue to be, or start to become a meaningful contributor to, to Tencent's earnings base and profitability and continue to be a, a driver for NASPERS going forward. So Nadir touched on briefly the the fact that you know South Africa continues to be a small market perched at at the end of of the the continent and very much at the mercy of of what happens in terms of global risk appetite and the rand as an emerging market currency continues to be one that is incredibly liquid and trades a huge amount on on a, a daily basis and as much as the there is more awareness around the individual themes that, that plague each and every emerging market. In a global risk off or, or risk on trade, all emerging markets tend to, to move and, and are, are highly correlated. So with, with the currency which, which is, is liquid and, and continues to, to act as, as a proxy and, and a measure for, for global risk appetite, our, our economy and, and our market are, are at the, the mercy of, of what happens on, on a global scale. So despite the, uh, what, what local businesses may, may be doing or, or what the, the local fundamentals look like, what is really driving a lot of volatility specifically in, in the market is, is driven more on a, a global scale. We've seen that foreigners have, have largely removed a lot of capital from, from our, our market over, over the, the, the year to date. And while our market has, has still continued to, to perform well due to, to more of a, a local bias, the impact of quantitative easing and the amount of money that that has and liquidity that that has injected into the system in an environment where, where interest rates, global interest rates have, have yet to normalize still plays a very big role. And we can see that in terms of the search for yield year to date we've seen that the the rand has has benefited from from a very much the yield differential over over us treasuries so when there is a wall of money that's that's looking to to generate yield emerging market currencies have been beneficiaries of of that um, as as money has has flowed into into those economies in in search and, and markets in search of of the yields so 
what we can see here is on the the x axis the the yield differential to to the the us dollar and you can see that that our, our interest rates in in SFA are still very much ahead of of global rates and along the y axis is the the year to date performance of of the the currency so money is very much still searching to, to those or flowing to those markets where where it can find yield and and the the wall of money that flows in and out of of our, our market is is really at the behest of of what global sentiment is and and as such our, our market will will remain at at risk for for what um the the current sentiment in in global markets plays out we've seen that with heightened fears around trade wars and um, the inability of the US and, and China to, to reach agreements on, on free trade and a, a, a world that's become more, more closely integrated in terms of, of trade. These heightened fears have, have definitely been plaguing the, the market over, over the past few weeks and, and we've seen a, a pullback as as the the geopolitical tensions in in the world rise as as china and and the us fight over over trade and so we will continue to to be very much at at the mercy of of what happens on on a global scale with the currency which which is liquid and and with a, a huge amount of of liquidity still still flowing around so that is one risk that is outside of, of the control of, of any SA business or, or of, of the, the local government and, and really puts our, our market at, at risk for, for what happens on, on the global stage and in terms of global sentiment. So one of the other themes that we've seen running quite strongly through the domestic market is that with a strong sell-off we've seen in listed property domestically led by the resilient group of companies but really spreading um, to the rest of the sector there's a lot of questions which have been raised about whether there's potentially value being offered within the domestic listed property market and this is a debate which we've had very robustly internally um, as to whether there's any value which is now present in the listed property market it remained the darling of at the market for a very long period of time prior to the big sell-off that we saw uh, probably starting at the back end of 2017 coming into 2018 um, and you know up until that point it had outperformed the majority of asset classes including uh, offshore asset classes despite a vociferously weakening rand um, and uh, you know we've seen this very sharp sell-off subsequent to that point we've seen uh, forward yields rising uh, quite substantially and in fact in excess of uh, forward bond yields at one point in time before derating um, and this has led to a lot of questions as to whether the sector offers value um, ultimately our view on this is that um, we are hanging on tight for now we're not allocating any additional capital um, to to South African listed property and the reason for that is that our view is that um, the derating has happened at the exact time that the quality of the sector has been significantly impaired um, there's a number of concerns around um, EDCON and the fact that EDCON is 7% of the listed property sector's uh, earnings um, and with a deal being extended to EDCON in terms of uh, capital injections um, and potentially just delaying the inevitable, uh, you know, when EDCON, it, it, for, the, for the future in terms of whether EDCON is a sustainable and ongoing business um, and the moral hazard that that has created amongst the other retail operators which have also been impacted by declining trading densities across the country. Uh, we believe that that's going to materially impact distribution growth going forward. Um, that's not to mention the fact that there's been a lot of one-off structures within the sector which has historically boosted distribution growth. Uh, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to repeat those one-off structures in order to boost distribution growth. Um, if one, it, it, the immediate one that comes to mind is basically uh, taking all your South African-based funding, converting it into Euro-based funding at a much lower rate, 
paying this fee to hedge out the currency and getting that additional yield pickup in terms of your distribution. The issue is that you get that benefit once off and when you've got to uh, report distribution growth next year, if you want to continue doing that trick, you've got to find a bigger and bigger offshore property deal or property deal to be able to finance using offshore financing. So that inherently increases the risk of your property portfolio. So I think the bottom line is that a quality has deteriorated in the sector, valuations have derated to, um, to, to kind of reflect that deteriorating quality um, and for now to us that still remains uh, you know an overarching concern before we can increase uh, any exposure to the sector and I think that this graph just highlights that point quite nicely um, the brown line is basically how the SAPI yield compares to the 10-year bond yield so whenever we see that line increasing uh, the SAPI yield is uh, starting to increase relative to the 10-year bond yield and whenever that line is decreasing the vice versa is happening um, and if we look at the, the green line, it's basically just a, a, a composite of 10 domestic South African stocks, excluding uh, the resilient group of companies and some of the offshore names um, and how those yields compare on a, on, on, on a forward basis relative to the 10 year government bond yield. What you'll notice is that valuations within the listed property sector are, are pretty much as attractive as they've been since the global financial crisis or since the trust of the global financial crisis um, just over 10 years. Years ago, um, the, the yields are looking attractive relative to the bond markets. But if you look at uh, the, the distribution growth, which is measured on the right hand axis, uh, distribution growth outlook is the by far the worst that it's been over that period as well, with you know circa only 3% forward distribution growth uh, being expected for the sector in composite. So the bottom line is that yes, the derating has happened, but a significant part of the derating in our view has to do with the fact that the distribution growth outlook is deteriorating. The outlook is more uncertain in terms of vacancies in the SA markets. Um, a lot of the tide has come out with regards to some of the offshore property portfolios that a lot of the operators have where depending on RAND weakness to bail them out in terms of earnings from that space. Um, and as such, uncertainty remains quite heightened within the sector. And we haven't necessarily allocated additional capital based on uh, the improving valuations just yet. So moving on to, to China, and China has become increasingly important in being a driver of, of uh, world uh, economic growth. And we can see that it's become very obvious that uh, the, the global economy is, is very much tied up with, with what happens within, within China. Uh, we saw the last GDP print out of China slightly lower than, than expected, so coming in at, um, oh, sorry, slightly ahead of, of expectations, so, so coming in at, at 6.4 when it was expected to, to be 6.3. Um, but the, the Chinese authorities are being required to to be ever more vigilant and and uh, involved in ensuring that that growth continues along the the expected path. The uh, play has been that China is is switching from from an industrial uh, led growth economy to to more consumer orientated economy, but that path has has been fairly uh, volatile and and the ability of them to to transition smoothly has has come under under question um, and and what we saw was that the government has has actually been forced to to step in and to to come up with a, a tax cut package in in order to to stimulate the the economy and and to to keep growth along the the expected um, line that um, that the the world has has come to to really de depend on and you know South Africa is is not immune to to depending on on Chinese growth either as as Chinese growth is is robust and and continues a, along a, a good path commodity prices are, are shown up which is is good for for our local economy and and for our, our local market 
And as, as long as China continues to, to grow, then the expectation is that world growth will, will continue along the, the same path and, and that China is, is very much um, one of the, the engines driving uh, world growth. So in an environment where, where Chinese growth is, is strong and, and continues, it's very positive for, for our, our market and um, it, it results in more of a, a risk off trade where uh, money flows into emerging markets and, and uh, the resource shares and, and commodity shares are, are, kept, uh, are kept buoyant. But there, there is risk because in, in a transitioning economy and in an economy that, that is as closely controlled as, as China, there is always the, the chance that, that things don't go as, as smoothly as, as expected and that the, the, the Chinese Politburo runs out of, of runway uh, in order to, to be able to, to continue that growth. And this is also very much at, at the risk of uh, what, what happens between the, the US and, and China and, and trade wars. And we'd have seen that with um, the US coming out again very strongly against Huawei. Huawei is one of the, the leading um, you know, Chinese companies that, that has done exceptionally well and, and penetrated markets on, on a global scale. And with the US clamping down and, and restricting their, their access to, to market, it's, it is going to, to impact uh, China specifically and, and the way in which they, they migrate to, to more of a consumer-led uh, economy. In this graph from, from the FT, you can see that, you know, since uh, 2014, really, as China has, has slowed down from the phenomenal growth rates we, we saw many years back from, from you know, in excess of 10% of down to, to closer to 6%, to that retail sales have have declined and and so has industrial production but government has, has really stepped in to to show up that that industrial production and um it's it's gone since 2000, 2016 it's it's gone sideways and what we saw at the end or at the the start of of 2019 was really government stepping in to to ensure that 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 uh, was was escalated, and so really a, a step back in terms of their their migration to to a consumer led economy, but but coming at at the the need to to ensure that growth continues along the the same path, and and really you know we we cannot know what happens in inside of China fully. It is still very much a, a controlled economy, and the data that that comes out can is is incredibly questionable. But you know the the tools that that the Chinese government has has in at its disposal are, are really geared up to to continuing that that industrial production, and it, it has proved a lot more more difficult for for them to. To migrate smoothly to to the so-called consumer-led economy as um, much much harder than than they would have liked. Moving on to the final theme that we'll be touching on today, um, we've seen it's it's ultimately you know concern regarding global equity markets and the need for very robust earnings growth to warrant the kind of multiples that we've seen um, so if we if we look at how global equity markets have prefer, performed over the year to date period and um, there's obviously been exceptionally strong prior to at uh, the beginning of may when the return of trade wars has actually come back and 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 resulted in sharp risk of sentiment and risk assets coming under pressure but prior to that point we saw um us equity markets in particular printing out the blocks, having their strongest start to a year in three decades. Um, and that's ultimately resulted once again in multiples expanding. Um, this has placed some significant pressure on US corporates in order to deliver the goods in terms of earnings and generate strong earning growth 
um, in order to warrant the multiples that these companies trade on. And in terms of how they've delivered on that mandate from the from the release of the first quarter earnings numbers, it's very much been a mixed bag. And um, I think there's been enough um, evidence of a robust US economy um, in order to keep uh, equity investors uh, invested and not too fearful outside of uh, flaring up of geopolitical tensions. Uh, but ultimately, the pressure remains on to continuously deliver the sustainable earnings growth um, and, 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 and continue this um, into the foreseeable future so that these, these markets and companies can grow into their forward multiples. Um, there's obviously some sectors which are showing signs of a more robust economy than others, and the banking sector in the US, for example, showed net interest margins expanding and expectations of ongoing expansion of net interest margins, although this time they'll require loan growth in order for that to happen instead of um, just uh, the Fed increasing interest rates because the Fed has taken a backseat in terms of the expectation for interest rates. Um, and it, it, in general, we see tech shares which are trading on very rich valuations. Um, some of those shares coming under pressure on the back of releasing the earnings results, one thing of Alphabet, which came under sustained pressure after they resulted slower than expected um, gains in the, in the advertising business. But in composite, US companies grew earnings by around about 2.5% or just below 2.5% for the first quarter, in a quarter where um, markets were expecting to see the first earnings growth decline um, in pretty much three years since the second quarter of 2016. Uh, that proved not to be the case. And um, it seems that companies are doing a very good job of maintaining their margins at very high levels. The market expected uh, margins to come under some pressure. That didn't happen as technological gains and automation has resulted in offsetting any increase in labor costs as a result of uh, wage inflation within the US in particular. And as a result of that, margins have been maintained, although the pressure remains on these uh, global equities to continue to deliver the goods with regards to earnings growth because multiples remain exceptionally elevated. Um, and in order to warrant those multiples, we need to see um, ongoing earnings growth. If we look at this picture, this is basically a ranking of earnings, valuation, performance and volatility by, by, by deciles. Uh, so basically, um, if we look at the earnings number as an example, uh, uh, essentially the current, that's earnings upgrades versus earnings downgrades that we see. And the higher that bar, basically the more earnings upgrades we're seeing relative to earnings downgrades compared to history. So we're seeing that the earnings upgrades relative to downgrades are at fairly depressed levels relative to the historic average. So we're not seeing many earnings upgrades. Um, the valuations are in stretched territory, so basically the higher that percentile, the higher current valuations are relative to their history. Performance is basically just a, a measure of th the last three months' performance on the MSCI World Index, and we see obviously that the first quarter of the year was exceptionally strong, so that performance measure is very high, um, and volatility is, as you can imagine, the higher the volatility quintile, uh, basically, uh, the, 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 the higher that the volatility we're experiencing. So volatility in the current environment are very low. So if you look at this picture and if you're going to summarize it, basically we're not seeing a lot of earnings upgrades. Valuations are quite stretched relative to history. Performance has been very good relative to history, which has resulted in valuations being quite stretched. And volatility is quite low. And this is quite a key factor coming into the start of the year. Despite the fact that there's a lot of political risk on the horizon, um, markets became exceptionally sanguine about these risks impacting markets and we saw it being one-way traffic upwards. We've seen that that's not the case with the trade wars coming back to bite and global markets selling off excessively on the back of uh, you know, the trade war coming back to bite through the course of May. So political risk remains abound and ultimately that needs to be priced into asset prices. What we've done over here is that there's obviously been a lot of noise made around tech and, you know, the successful tech companies being Google, Microsoft, Apple, uh, Facebook, even though that are, that are highly profitable. Uh, but there's been a number of unicorns which have come to the market, so-called tech companies with a valuation of in excess of a billion dollars. And we've got this chart from uh, The Economist. And basically what it shows is that investors really do need to be aware because a lot of these companies are not making money and possibly will never make money. Um, if you look at the Uber listing statement, IPO statement as, as an indication, they say in the IPO statement, this company may never make money yet. That company was commanding something like a $90 billion valuation initially before the sell-off. Ultimately, the grouping of these 40, a grouping of 47 tech unicorn companies which have come to market um, in 2018 and uh, coming into market in 2019 
ultimately these companies generating um, significant losses uh, over the uh, over the cumulatively around um, eight, 19 billion dollars in losses over the last two years they generate negative operating margins and it's quite difficult to see how these companies ever start making money yet they're commanding very rich valuations so it's been the likes of these shares which have been skewing the multiples of the market higher um, and ultimately we remain quite concerned about such uh, such activities just to wrap up on, uh, you know, we've already pr pretty much touched on this. Uh, the geopolitical risk indicator remained quite sanguine coming into 2019. Uh, that's st started to, uh, to become heightened once again in May. But ultimately, the point of this chart that we tried to make is that uh, markets were very, very sanguine about the political risks in the market coming into the start of the year. Uh, they've now, uh, those exact risks have come back to bite risk assets. We've seen a bit of a sell-off, and this is undoubtedly something which market participants need to be quite aware of uh, going go, going forward uh, so that's that's pretty much where we'll wrap up we're happy to take any questions if there are any okay it appears that we we, we have no questions so we're going to let everybody go thank you everybody for dialing in and we really appreciate your time yeah, thank you for your time. We will make the uh, presentation available and uh, and send it out to to anybody that that would like a, a copy.